Hey guys, back here at the Joshi Pod, and very excited to have somebody who I had to lean on early because when I started the podcast, I had zero contacts in wrestling. I had zero contacts in podcasting. I was kind of teaching myself as I went along. And the person I think about, I'll, the two people I think about the most when I, I think about wrestling podcasting, uh, one of them is on the line with me right now, Wei Ting from Post Wrestling. Uh, welcome to the Joshi Pod, Wei. Hey, Eric. Um, pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's that's very nice of you to say. And I DM'd Way on Twitter, and I, I asked for his suggestions and a little bit of help here and there from technical stuff, and and he took his time to give me a thoughtful answer and actually listen to an episode and give me a thoughtful give me thoughtful feedback, which he didn't have to do. So again, I, I can't thank Way enough for just taking that little bit of time and, and helping a new guy on the block with uh, getting off the ground. Oh, it's not. It was honestly my pleasure, and it's something I actually like enjoy and I'm passionate about. You know, just like the the technical side of like podcasting, or just even like you know the I don't know the practical side of podcasting. So um, I've been in positions very similar to you. Uh, just happy to pass on whatever knowledge I have. It's it's something I I'd be happy to do like for anybody. That's kind of you. Yeah, because uh, people don't understand like pot. Or, you and John are not John Pollock. You guys do the, the post wrestling together. You guys aren't in the same room when you guys podcast anymore, correct? Not since the you know everything shut down. I mean, even prior to like when uh, the pandemic, of course, like we we would only really gather like once a week to record. In the past, um, because we used to work in the same office building for a TV station, we would be recording in the same room a whole lot more often. But uh, ever since we started post wrestling on our own, like. You know, because Raw and SmackDown would, would occur so late at night and we'd record right after. Often it wouldn't necessarily make sense for me to drive all the way down mm -hmm. to his place or him to my place just to record a two-hour show when the technology and quality is so good these days that it really doesn't make a whole whole lot of difference. So since the pandemic, we've just been doing everything exclusively, like, it remote, remotely. Yeah, and then that's kind of what I, the life I've had to live, too, with, you know, doing most of my interviews over Skype or Zoom. And it, it's funny. I mean, this is going to be the technical stuff people are probably going to get bored hearing about. But it's my mic levels. It's my interpreter's mic levels at his house. And it's the wrestler's mic levels off their phone, basically, in mm. Japan. And having to, to clean all that up and make it sound halfway decent is, can be a struggle sometimes. Oh, without a doubt, yeah. Just the educational process in dealing with people... Uh, I guess varying levels of like technical aptitude um, that in itself is is half the battle you know the interview I'm sure for you is like the fun part but the rest of it is is a bit challenging but thankfully like you have a lot of different types of um, options these days to mm -hmm. kind of you know ensure like the best type of uh, audio avail is available for anybody um, but yeah de there's definitely a level of technical management to to go with the job. I had to teach people that don't speak a word of English how to I, sign up for Skype. I, I can't imagine. <laughs> Damn. So, like in Japan, though, like is there like an equivalent that that might be preferred? No. Of Skype. No. Right. No, there's not. Yeah. They don't. They don't Zoom. They don't Skype. They don't do like. I mean, they, they have. Was it Line? Line. I think is what yeah. They, yeah, Line is what they use over there mostly. But I'm not familiar with that. So I got to teach them how to like download and, and sign up for Skype. And knock on wood, it's worked out pretty well so far. Well, yeah, you're almost a year in, aren't yeah. you? Yeah, I'm. Uh, Saturday will be uh, Halloween. Will be one year in, and I'm gonna have Aki Asakawa on the podcast. Wow, it's amazing. Wow, the, uh, just the consistency is is to me the 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 most difficult and most important part of doing this type of thing. To see that you've been very consistent um, for the past year that's that's really cool. Yeah, thank you. So you you way you grew up as a wrestling fan, correct? Yes. And at what point did you think I'm going to go from a fan to being something more than a fan? Hmm. Um, honestly, I've, I've never really had that particular, you know, um, epiphany. Um, mm -hmm. It was more so just um, let me think about this, because like, I mean, I was always a fan like most people growing up. And then I kind of had my dark ages mm -hmm. for a few years. I got back in. um once I started working for a TV channel known as the Fight Network, and um, uh, as an intern, you know, my, part of my job was to uh, edit shows for broadcast quality. So I would take like an ROH videotape or ROH DVD, and then basically edit commercials within it to fit a certain. 
Um, so that kind of got me back in. And then as well, of course, being, uh, you know, taken to um, uh, being chosen to work for The Law, Live Audio mm-hmm. Wrestling, which was an audio wrestling show that Fight Network owned at the time. That kind of brought me right back into the current state of things, too, because by that point, I would say I was more of an MMA fan. I kind of like gotten tired of pro wrestling, uh, jumped on with like the Ultimate Fighter on Spike TV and then mm-hmm. just kind of fully went back into MMA instead. Um, but that brought me back into the pro wrestling side of things. And then being involved with the law, um, I guess, you know, uh, John would occasionally have me on to do like a bonus podcast to attach to the end of the law for their podcast version. And that just kind of grew and grew into, you know, a series of like mini reviews that he and I would do just maybe 10 minutes long at the end of the show. And eventually those continued to grow in popularity to the point where we expanded those into probably like hour plus shows. And then that expanded into reviewing current Raw and SmackDown and Impact. And uh, 12 years later, uh, it's my full time job now. That's amazing. That's a that's a Excuse me. You guys have earned that. You guys are putting out just quality content. It's funny. I was in line one time at a PWG show. You've been to PWG before. You know the lines out there outside. I've never been actually. Oh, you never went. Oh, oh. I had a chance actually. Like, um, I was down there shooting a documentary about Twitch, and so I actually had a chance on a weekend. But those tickets were so hard to come by anyway. But anyway, it was at the end of such a long day. I like, I just, I couldn't like make the drive to Reseda and still get ready for the shoot the next day. So I, I've never had a chance. No, yeah, that stinks. Yeah, I, I was standing in line. The lines are terribly long. You have to wait there for hours, and you know, you, you almost have to talk to the person next to you to pass time. And there was this kid, probably early twenties, late teens, early twenties, probably. And he's from Canada, and um, we just started talking about wrestling. And I, I mentioned you and John. He's like, "Oh, I love those guys. They're Canadians." I'm like, "He's like, you know them?" I'm like, "Yeah, that's John and Way. They're they're, they're my favorite podcast." So, oh, you know, amazing. yeah, we we had a good conversation about you two for a bit, standing in line at PWG. That is super cool. Yeah, uh, and that's still like amazing to, for me to hear. Um, just the idea that people. All the way down in uh, Reseda, like a place I've never even stepped foot in, would would know who we were. So that's that's awesome, man. Yeah, and so you guys, the the Fight Network and all that kind of stuff, you know, kind of whatever happened happened, and you guys mm-hmm. had to kind of break out on your own. What was the plan for you and John? To was it immediate? You guys knew, or was there something you guys kind of had to figure out before you you pulled the trigger on post wrestling? You know, I would say it was quite immediate. In fact, um, we were having discussions about like breaking off on our own even prior to us being mm-hmm. let go from our jobs, you know, as as recent as like uh, the weekend prior. I think we were let go on a Monday, uh, like that Friday. I remember actually having meetings after work with John talking about our, our plan. And, um, you know, we weren't necessarily thinking, hey, like we're going to pull the trigger right away. But it was more something that we were thinking about doing maybe months down the road. Um, cause I think he and I were both pretty, you know, fed up with maybe our lack of growth in the company. Mm-hmm. And, um, we, you know, thought about what our options at that point would be. And we, you know, we were probably having conversations like for months leading up to the, to it. And then the next Monday, basically the, the decision was made for us. And so that day we knew pretty much exactly what we wanted to do. Cause the plans were already kind of so, sort of set in motion. Do you and John consider yourselves entrepreneurs at all? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, again, it's something I I, I I wouldn't label as myself uh, <laughs> introducing myself to anybody or like, um, you know, I, it's not something I would put on my Twitter profile or anything like that. Um, but entrepreneur essentially just means you start and own your own business. And I think these days, like, I hate to even put a label on it because I think it's almost like a life skill, you know, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. Can somebody like, do you drive your own car? You know, are you a show like, are you a professional yeah. car driver? No, it's just like have being able to like own and manage your own finances and your own business should just be, it, it should, there shouldn't be a label on it. It should, it should just be, you know, something that like, I don't know, doing your own dishes or, or whatever. But some people, you know, are the, 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 when they have their first job, when they're working at McDonald's or Tim Hortons or wherever they're working at, they they have that idea like I want to be my own boss someday, you know, and and have that in the back of their head. It's like that's my ultimate goal is to be, to be my own boss. Did you did you have that mentality at all? No, not at all. 
Yeah, I'm, 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 I can't really say I ever had those aspirations. It's, you know, um, like being a business owner at this point, it was just something that, that kind of came out of necessity. And also because working, I guess, for all those years doing the, the, the podcasting thing ourselves, being in a pretty like, you know, uh, we weren't really managed. Like we were doing it all our, our, ourselves under the umbrella of another company anyway. So we knew exactly what needed to be done. Of course, you know, the, the tricky stuff, like the accounting properly, like, um, uh, what is it? Registering for a business. That's all stuff we absolutely needed help with. And that was always like the boring un not fun part of the, the business that we had to really understand for the first year. Um, so in that sense, I suppose that's more the entrepreneurial side of things, but the rest of it was like very much, you know, just a continuation of what we were already doing, just except maybe even exaggerated and amplified now. It was kind of cool to follow that along when you guys uh, initially just came on and you guys were pretty open and talking about that kind of stuff as well. And it was kind of neat to follow you guys and, and cheer you guys along as you guys went through that journey. Yeah, I appreciate that. Cause, um, I definitely got that sense too. like, you know, part of like what makes podcasting so unique is that, um, I mean, depending on your style of podcasting, it offers a lot of opportunity to you, for you to share like, w you know, what's going on with your life to your audience outside of what you're there to cover. Um, so for us, I think we had always, you know, crafted, um, I guess, a. I don't know, a tone and, and, and a style that, that was very personal where John and I would reveal you know, sometimes maybe too many details about our, our personal lives. Um, and in this case, of course, the biggest thing in our lives was creating a business. And I would say like the Patreon thing is definitely conducive to like revealing that sort of information as well, where people are financially supporting you. And I think they would be the people that would be most interested in knowing you know what what was happening with the money that they were spending um what was happening just personally with us what was happening with the over the course of the business because this whole thing really wouldn't be created without like um uh, the audience without their financial support without just their attention and so um they i think like everybody you know like yourself included as you just mentioned it just we we wanted to take everybody for the ride yeah, and I'll be honest with you. I I more listened for you to you guys for the conversation about John's neighbor's Christmas lights versus, mm -hmm. you know, you guys reviewing uh, Monday Night Raw because you know I, I watched Raw, so I already know what happened there. But I, I listened more. I mean, I listened to the re you guys review it, but I more listened to hear what you guys talk about whatever your your day to day lives were. It's something I I really struggled with at, at the beginning because like in my mind I like to like compartmentalize um things like. You know, if it's a podcast, I'm even I'm thinking like, well, what kind of podcast is it? Are we a lifestyle podcast or are we a pro wrestling podcast? Well, we're a pro wrestling podcast. So in my mind, I'm like, shouldn't we just get to the pro wrestling right away, you know, and like forget all this other stuff? But then like, you know, we would have these conversations out loud on the show. And then inevitably, we'd always get feedback from our audience saying they want like the other stuff, you know, for like screw time limits on how, mu how much time we spent on the banter. Like they just want people just kind of like like the natural conversation. And that made me understand. And you know what? Like listening to podcasts I listen to on a regular basis, like, um, you know, when I listen to Davey and, and Braden, our friends who uh, host our uh, the uh, the NXT um, podcast, I'm way more interested in knowing like their their personal lives than um, even like, you know, just a recap of NXT. So I, I totally get it. it it's it's. Two people you can tell like each other, you and you and John. I, I think unless you guys are just uh, fooling us very well, I, I'm guessing no, you two like each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would, I would say so. I'm but sure it, we get into heated arguments where where he gets sick of me, but um, yeah, yeah, we're friends. But it, it's nice. People like to hear people who get along talk to each other. You know, I, I enjoy yeah. that. I mean, I don't like to hear arguing all the time. I mean, there's. There's plenty of podcasts and TV shows and people disagreeing and arguing all the time. And I don't know. Sometimes it's nice just to, to relax and hear two friends chit chat. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that I've always enjoyed about podcasting myself is just, you know, like it just feels like you are sitting down at the table, listening to a couple classmates or friends having a conversation about something you're interested in. And that could be talking about themselves or it could be talking about a subject that, you know, you're passionate about. Um, and I tend to be like, I mean, I'm I'm definitely more of like an introverted um, guy, at least like throughout, you know, high school. And so just to kind of be there, not even being required to 
have to talk to the uh, to the other person um just listening to their conversation is is just in a way i guess kind of comforting and um i yeah i understand it I, I try to take my my interview style kind of from you guys as well, where it's more of a conversation and less of a, you know, write 20 questions down and ask people like a QA and a kind of thing. It was more just, I mean, I, you know, consciously took that from you guys to, to, to have conversations and not interviews. Well, um, you know, I would definitely credit John with that a whole lot more than me. Like I to this day don't really do the whole interview thing unless like you know i'm doing it with with john but like john is so incredibly experienced having you know spoken to so many people over the years and i've noticed too just kind of studying the way he does it he's uh he's very good at 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 creating that sort of like conversational uh feel where he actually listens and he'll respond to somebody like based on their I think when you're starting out at least like for me you know i still get kind of nervous doing interviews from time to time and I'm more so like at that point, just like thinking, oh, how do I follow up on this? Like what's what comes next? I don't want there to be any dead space. And that feels more mechanical and less like a conversation. So I don't know if it's just something that requires a lot of experience or maybe just like, you know, like something, uh, you know, that you have to tell yourself. But I mean, you've been doing it for a year. How, how have you changed over the past year? Um, I, I've been able to, to listen and think of questions at the same time. <laughs> I've been able to, to to get that skill. You know, I, I've that's that's come about more and more and more as I've interviewed people. And also, I'm trying. I use an interpreter sometimes as well, which makes it even a more of a challenge. You know, of of listening to my interpreter at the same time, trying to think of the next question as well. But I don't know. I, I've just been able to to do that. I, I mean, I, I told somebody the other day that, you know, I've, I never written questions down for anybody before during my, for my interviews. I've done Is research. Right? And, yeah. Wow. I've, I've done research and read, but I've never actually wrote down, you know, 10 list of questions for people to, to ask them. I do it all off the top of my head. And I, I think I just came with experience, you know, doing that. And, and, and I mean, it's, I imagine like you prefer to do it that way, but are there ever moments where you feel like, man, I should have asked this or should have like, you know, brought this up? Yeah, a couple of times, but I, I think the overall experiences, the the wrestlers have given me feedback on, they've, they've enjoyed it. So I, I don't think, I, I don't look back and, and kind of feel bad that I didn't ask a certain question because the overall outcome was positive so i'm, I'm not going to look back and say oh if i would have done this it would have been better no it was a good experience for me it was a good experience for the wrestler it was a good experience for the listener so that's good enough for me but i i would assume that your research has to be very like you know you have to be very confident like in in what you've retained right in order to enter without like because i consider notes i consider like you know maybe just even a list of questions to be sort of like a safety net and you're kind of going in without one yeah, I've got nothing. No, it's it's also, I mean, a lot of the people I'm interviewing, the information is either not, doesn't exist, you know, in, on the internet, or it's not mm. right. Mm. So a lot of the people that I've interviewed, you know, I, I kind of just ask them certain questions and let them tell their own story versus me trying to, and then, and then following up on what they tell me versus me like going back on, okay. I mean, I go to cage match and look at like certain matches people had and I'll bring those kind of things up. But, but yeah, for the most part, I just let them tell their own story by, you know, asking kind of general questions and then that gets the conversation flowing. And then I just play off of them from that point on. That's really good. I think I think that probably gets reflected in the in just the you know maybe more organic like tone of of the interviews. Like when I think about like my favorite interviewers, um, it's not like they're reading off a script. You know, like the, the ones that are like on TV or like you know their podcast is being recorded for for video. It's like everything is just off the top of their heads. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a fun challenge. I mean, I did the Bull Nakano face to face with no 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 nothing written down, just you know, inside of a karaoke room in Tokyo and interviewing Bull Nakano, and yeah, I think it came off really well. That's awesome. So, well, you got to go to Japan, correct? Yeah, a few times. Tell me about your experiences in Japan. Yeah, well, the first time I went was probably at least like more than ten years ago. Um, my brother. You know, uh, my older brother, James, he's always had a huge fascination with Japan uh, growing up. And so he by the time I went, he had already been multiple times. In fact, um, he ended up marrying a, um, a Japanese wife uh, while living in Hong Kong. So he would go back and forth, you know, to visit her family and whatnot. So he was already very familiar with Tokyo. He brought me there. 
And um, I just, you know, I didn't really have too many expectations about Japan. Like I wasn't as into maybe the cultural side of things as he was. Mm -hmm. But the moment I got there, the moment he really unlocked it for me, um, showing me the various different uh, areas of Tokyo, um, the food that was available, um, and just the culture that was available, I immediately fell in love. And I realized like it was a place that really kind of fit Mm, maybe my personality and just like my taste you know what i loved about it was the fact that um so much of it is so similar to things that we like in western culture except it's either slightly twisted or it's completely amplified in a way (laughs) that we don't get here and what i mean by that is you can be you know you can be a video game like nerd i guess in north america and you might go to a GameStop once in a while um being a video game nerd in japan in tokyo is like you will be completely overwhelmed um any system that you've ever thought about like a jaguar or whatever lynx you remember that like Mm -hmm. you find you'll probably find a bunch of lynx games if you have a lynx collection um in like five different stores on the same block if you're into music the record shopping is impeccable like the quality of all the vinyl is insane um if you're into instruments like you can go to ochano mizu and like find 10 different instrument stores that are like five floors each um it's just everything and of course you know getting into pro wrestling um i guess you know it's weird because like pro wrestling i think is a bit more hidden like you kind of have to go and search for it it's not like there's a pro wrestling store but uh i did like one time going to japan on my own wander into uh tarzan goto's bar tarzan goto of like uh fmw (laughs) fame i just Uh like uh, I just walked outside. I was just like wandering the streets. And then I see like, oh, pro wrestling on the window. I go downstairs and the dude is sitting right there. So <laughs> you have those experiences in Tokyo. It's just a magical, magical place. And you went to a Wrestle Kingdom? Yeah, this past year, right before the whole world, you know, fell apart and, and collapsed. So I'm really happy about that. Um, I went with John actually and made it a bit of a work trip slash, you know, um, vacation for me and my fiance. So uh, first week was Wrestle Kingdom. We went to a bunch of indie shows as well. So went to a stardom show um, at, at, at Shinkiba First Ring. Uh, I went to, I believe, a Noah show as well at Korakuen. And then, of course, the two nights at the Tokyo Dome. So that was an awesome experience that I'm really glad we fit in before everything you know like it was just at the like at the tip of like um you know before everything got shut down so i've been to wrestlemania but i've not been to a wrestle kingdom how would you compare the two wrestlemania is well uh, you mean like the experience of going or the actual events themselves the experience going okay uh wrestle well, WrestleMania at this point is not just WrestleMania. It's an entire week, I would say, of, of uh, you know, supplementary events uh, or, like, you know, wraparound events uh, mm-hmm. put on by both the WWE and also all the independent wrestling. So for me, the draw of WrestleMania these days is not so much the WrestleMania event itself, but it's, like, you know, going to a GCW show uh, prior to it or, or going to... Uh, an ROH super super card super card of honor before it or uh, you know NXT it's just it's a chance to see every wrestler that you may have heard of in the same city it's really a festival so like you know like the, like what South by Southwest might be or like what um can Comic-Con. might be Comic Con Comic Con yeah. exactly you know everything every personality within this kind of like thing that you like the subculture will there's a good chance that they will be in that city and you will be able to see them perform or at least meet them for an autograph or something like that during that weekend so it's very consuming and it's awesome it's great and you're also surrounded by all these fans that also love the same thing that you do um so that's i would say like um you know wrestlemania weekend at this point is like a bit longer like in and it's like it's great whereas um like a Wrestle Kingdom weekend, you kind of have that too, but it's not as maybe global, you know, like it's more focused on the Japanese scene. So, yeah, you know, it's it, it's sort of the same thing, but like except you get to see a lot of Japanese stars. Uh, you might not see, you know, uh, I don't know, your favorite WWE stars that weekend. You probably won't actually. But if you're a fan of Japanese wrestling, um, there's a very good chance in Tokyo somebody will be doing a show um, that, that week. And... Maybe it's not as, you know, like, um, it's a bit more sprawled out perhaps than, 
than maybe a WrestleMania weekend. But then again, it's yeah, I, I can't even really say for sure. But um, I they're very similar. I guess they just kind of focus on different parts of the subculture. Yeah. So at what point in your business, Wade, I mean, I'm going to ask a personal question. You can refuse to answer it if you want that that you like financially, you felt comfortable when you had to start your own business and go out on your own that you're like, OK, I can do this full time. You know, I'm, I'm making enough money to survive. Mm, right. Um, for us, I think we were going to give this like a year either way. Like mm. even if we weren't making anything, we were going to. Um, but luckily, it didn't take a whole lot of time before like our Patreon, our subscriber base got to a level that was like enough to cover like our living expenses. And that mm. is, I realized completely like not the norm. Uh, when mm -hmm. it comes to people starting podcasts, when it comes to people on Patreon. So uh, in that sense, uh, John and I both feel incredibly blessed, like every single day. Um, but yeah, like we just kind of kept going like that mm -hmm. year passed. And it was just like, hey, like we can keep doing this. So let's keep doing it. And we just haven't really looked back since. So like from day one, we just always had the mentality like we're doing this full time. Yeah, and that's a testament to you two for being putting out what people want to hear. You guys have figured out the the cheat code or whatever you want to call it. You know that y you guys have uh, you guys have done it. I mean, it, it, it's something to be very proud of. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I think you know a lot of it comes down to the fact that we were relatively early getting into the game of, mm -hmm. of podcasting, being attached to a name brand like the Law at the time, which was like a you know, pretty well recognized like audio wrestling. Uh, thing you know instit institution at that point uh, definitely helps and of course like working with somebody like, as immensely talented as, as John like it's it it's easy being on my end you know like so, so it's yeah but, all these but, things help. but you two you two complement each other though what you guys what you guys bring to the table so I think that's just the, the, the package you guys have figured out and that works no I appreciate that so, Wade, tell us, uh, give us the lineup on post wrestling. What, what can we hear if we uh, subscribe to post wrestling? So, right now, if you go to uh, just YouTube, wherever you, or sorry, uh, iTunes, or sorry, it's not even iTunes, Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Crazy Play, Exchange, Stitcher, yeah, yeah, just search post wrestling, P O S T space wrestling, and every Monday we do a raw review, very, very uh, comprehensive. We talk about the day's news. On Wednesday we do the same thing, but except it's for AEW Dynamite. And uh, beyond that, we have pay-per-view reviews, we have UFC reviews, we have occasional guest uh, reviews on the weekends from our friends WH Park talking about old school uh, Ultra Pan Pro Wrestling from the 90s. Uh, our friend Nate Milton does a review of The Rock's movie catalog called The Rocky Maivi Picture Show. Um, and then of various occasional you know, specialty shows that will appear. That's all on our free feed if you just search Post Wrestling. Uh, People who like us enough to subscribe to our Patreon can also get the rest of the shows that fill out the rest of the schedule. So uh, in between Raw and SmackDown on a Tuesday, every single week, we do a specialty retro review podcast. We'll do our uh, monthly Q&A. We'll do a, sp like, a special movie podcast. We just finished the entire Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe chronology. And right now we're doing Rocky so we're working our way through that. Uh, and then on uh, Fridays, of course, we have Rewind to SmackDown. That is also a Patreon exclusive. So uh, it's a pretty full schedule for people who want the full experience. But if you just want the partial experience, you can get that for free just by looking at Post Wrestling. And guys, if you haven't listened to those two yet, please do so. They're they're definitely worth the listen. They're worth the investment. They're worth the time. They they put out just great content. And uh, yeah, they're, they're the kings of, of pod, wrestling podcasting in my mind. So... Yeah, please uh, give them a, a listen. Thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, um, it's, um, you know, there's, there, everybody has, like, I think their preference for um, voices to cover the thing that they like. Um, you don't have to listen to us. We just encourage you to, like, find the one that fits you. And thankfully, a lot of people seem to think that we fit their their taste. And Wei, where can we find you on social media? You can find me at Wei0937. That's W-A-I and the numbers 09 three and seven where did zero nine three seven just that was what it was available um yeah yeah it's uh it, <laughs> yeah uh numbers um one to zero nine three six were all taken <laughs> uh 
No, it's 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 a bit personal. I've always okay. had a hu- huge fast. No, I'll tell you. I've always okay. had a huge fascination with uh, the Lego construction toy, and zero nine three seven just happens to be a number that you could insert in a calculator and flip upside down to spell Lego. Oh, uh, that's one I never knew. I knew the hell one and the hello and stuff like that, but I didn't know Lego. I wouldn't expect you to to know that one. It's a bit of a <laughs> s- sort of a full speak. So uh, now I know. Now I'm going to go show my friends at work. Like, look, look at this, guys. Yeah. I and mean, then they'll be like, uh, stick to your uh, yeah. grade. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Way, thank you so much for your time, buddy. I appreciate it. And I wish you guys the best of luck at post wrestling. It's a real pleasure, Eric. And um, I'm happy to see you, your growth and, and look forward to maybe speaking to you again in the future. Yeah.